his heart. Uh, let's hear from God's word, which is the basis of the comments this morning. It comes from Luke chapter 15. It begins with verse 1 and it concludes with verse 7. I encourage you to find Luke 15, 1 and follow along. Not only hear it, but also see it and let God place in your life those kinds of things that he wants you to hear this morning. Luke 15, 1. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finishes it, or finds it rather, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found the lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. May God speak to us once again from his holy word. Do you have any Harry Potter fans here? One of the things about Harry Potter is Harry Potter has that invisibility cloak, you know? He gets to wrap himself up in invisibility and he can sneak in around the place. Being invisible seems like something that'd be pretty cool. But really cool if you can choose to do it. Or the story of the invisible man. Now the invisible man was always invisible, couldn't control it. And we think, well, that, that'd be pretty cool. You'd sneak around, nobody really know you're there. There's another side of that coin. We would only want to be invisible if we choose to be invisible. It's no fun being invisible all the time. No one sees you. No one knows you. Nobody cares. I've been invisible. I'm guessing that many of you have been invisible too. Often stood in the middle of a crowd where nobody notices me, nobody knows me, nobody cares. I've been there. Maybe you've moved to a new location and you don't know anyone. When we first moved to, to Delaware, I didn't know anybody in Delaware. We'd go to school events for the kids and him and I would go in and nobody saw us, nobody talked to us. Uh, nobody greeted us. We were invisible. Invisible is awkward. It's uncomfortable. It's demeaning. It's embarrassing. It's something that nobody really likes. We all need to be noticed, right? We, we all want to make a difference. We want to be important. We, we want to make a difference, at least to somebody. We want to be seen. I, I love the movie, The Avatar. Um, in that movie, the tribal people had a way of greeting one another, not, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> but I see you. They would say, I see you. That says a lot, doesn't it? I mean, we might say hello to people or, hey, how are you doing? But, you know, we're not looking for an answer to the question. We may not even look up. We may not even see them. They may be invisible to us. We don't want an answer. Do we ever really see them? You know, most people have had that kind of an experience even in the church, right? Going in among people and, and never being seen, never being noticed. Never wonder, does my life make, life make any difference? Do people notice me, value me, see me, care about me, love me? Do you ever feel invisible? Well, I've got good news for you today. The God who made you, in fact, the God who made everything in this world, everything in the universe, knows you, sees you, loves you. 
If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on. <laughs> and he wants you to know. So let's find out what he has to say. But before we do that, let's bow our heads and our hearts for a word of prayer. Lord, as we come to your word, we pray that you'd speak to our hearts. But more, make your presence known to us. Impress your presence upon us. For we know that your word is not just words in a book. Your word is, is not just print on a page. It's not just stories. It's not even just histories, not rules of do's and don'ts. But your word is living and active. And by it, you make yourself known to us. So we pray that you would come, that you'd move freely among us. We pray that in this time, we might hear the soft sound of sandal feet and know that we have been in your presence and be changed by that. We pray for the one who teaches that you'd hide him behind the cross, that in this time we might see Jesus and him only. For it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Many people wonder about, is there a God? And if there is a God, is it possible to know anything about that God? But maybe the more critical issue is this, knowing that there is a God, a personal God, a conscious and omnipotent being, and that he knows you. That he knows everything about you. He who gave you life and breath is interested in the nitty gritty details of your life. And he takes notice of all this. Why? Because he loves you. He really does. He loves you. Not the guy next to you. Well, he loves them too. But you. He loves you. And he knows you intimately, warts and all, and he still loves you. That ought to blow you away all by itself. It ought to knock your socks off just to know that God would notice you at all. You know, the President of the United States, I'm going to bet, has never noticed any of you or me. Most of us are not even on the radar of the governor of our little state. Maybe you've written to your senator or your congressman, but if somebody told them your name, probably wouldn't mean anything to them. Bill Gates has no clue who you are. <laughs> Anne Hathaway doesn't care who you are. And as famous and as important as some of these people may be, their notoriety pales in comparison with the holy God of the universe, but he knows you. He knows you. The psalmist David observes the meticulous details of life that the Lord is aware of and lovingly catalogs when he declares, you've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. The Lord knows you. And he calls you his own. He said through Isaiah, but now this is what the Lord says. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Let's get some perspective on that. According to Ephesians 4.10, God fills the entire universe. There is not a place in the entirety of creation where God is not present. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. God not only made the universe, but God fills the whole universe. God is greater than we can imagine. King Solomon observed when he completed the temple, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. So what does that mean? In 1977, Ray and Charles Eames created a documentary film for IBM called Powers of Ten. Keep that in your mind, Powers of Ten. I, I recommend that when you go home, go on your computer and check it out on Vimeo or, or, or YouTube. It's about nine minutes long, so I can't show it here. Uh, but they, what they do is they, they start with a scene, and then by Powers of Ten, they move out, okay? It begins with a couple having a picnic at Burnham Park near Soldiers Field in Chicago, and then it moves 10 meters away. 
and then 10 to the second power, or 100 meters away, the distance a man can run in about 10 seconds. And then 10 to the third power, or a kilometer, 1,000 meters, the distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. Now we're moving away at a factor of 10 every 10 seconds, and in continuing to zoom out until we'll, to reach a, a factor of 10 to the 24th power. As the film progresses, we go to 10 to the 5th, uh, meters and we see the curve of Lake Michigan. At 10 to the 7th we can see the sphere of the whole earth in one in one picture. At 10 to the 9th the earth is merely a small point of light. At 10 to the 12th before we even see the sun and or before we even see the sun in part of the of the path of the outer planets the earth is just a speck in the picture. At 10 to the 14th, our solar system shrinks and the sun appears to be one among many stars. At 10 to the 16th, we reach one light year, but we haven't even reached another star yet. At 10 to the 21st, we can see the shape of the Milky Way galaxy. At 10 to the 22nd, or a million light years, we include the clouds of Magellan, two satellite galaxies next to our own. At 10 to the 23rd, single points of light are no longer single stars, but whole galaxies that we see as one little point of light. The film takes you out to that distance and then takes you back in to that scene of the, the couple uh, having a picnic in the park. And it, it goes and focuses on the man's hand. And the film starts zooming inward by factors of 10, down to the capillaries, down to the cells, down to the DNA at 10 to the negative 7th power. Electrons at 10 to the negative 10th or 1 angstrom. The carbon nucleus at 10 to the negative 13th with its protons and neutrons in constant motion. At 10 to the negative 16th, we reach the edge of our power of understanding. And the vastness of the world is astronomical, absolutely mind-blowing. And when you consider all that of what significance is humankind in relation to all that? Of what significance could our lives be? The psalmist observes, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of and human beings that, it, that you care for? Them? And he continues, you've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers of the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. In comparison to all that God has created, of what significance, of what value are you and I? <coughs> the answer is this. You are of great significance because you are significant to God who not only notices, but seeks you out when you wander away and rejoices over you with great love when you're found. Now tuck that away in the back of your mind. I was listening to the bridge radio station this week. They were talking about a young boy. I'll call him Kevin. I don't really remember his name. But Kevin recognized how important it is for kids to have friends. He was concerned about bullying and, and the first day of school and all that. And, and he decided that, uh, that if there were kids who didn't have friends, that he would offer to be a friend to any kid that didn't have a friend because he thought that was important. In fact, his mom supported him by making him a t-shirt that says, I will be your friend. And I'll bet on the first day of school, Kevin's going to have a lot of friends. Because the best way to have friends is to be a friend, isn't it? Jesus went beyond the offer of friendship. He simply proclaims that we are his friends. He chose us as his friends. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I've learned from the Father I've made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit. Jesus could have called us servants. After all, he's the master of everything. He created everything, and everything belongs to him, including us. But he didn't choose to be our boss. He didn't choose to be our benefactor. He didn't choose to just simply put up with us. He chose to be our friend. He chose 
to put his own reputation on the line and identify with us as friends. Jesus was, was told, it was told that Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. Do you, do you realize the, the impact that has in Middle Eastern culture to eat with someone was to identify them, to, to proclaim your friendship toward them? Son of man came eating and drinking. And you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. It's interesting that Jesus didn't, didn't reject that reputation. He could have changed it by going out of his way to avoid sinners or, or even to show some hostility towards sinners, as most people would, be tend, would tend to do. But he doesn't avoid sinners. In fact, he seeks them out. He searches for them and he hunts for them to bring the lost ones home. Now the Pharisees and the teachers of the law did not consider themselves to be sinners. Other people, they were sinners. Other people were not as diligently keeping the law or even going beyond the letter of the law as the Pharisees were wont to do. They considered themselves to be righteous and worked hard to maintain that reputation. They were the in crowd and they loved that reputation. They love to get attention for their acts of righteousness. But acts is just what they were. Outward actions meant to gain a reputation. Inner righteousness, inner goodness was not something that concerned them. And they couldn't understand anyone who wasn't like them. They considered anyone who didn't share their views to be beneath them. Jesus said of them, everything they do is done for people to see. And that's the very thing that prevented them from entering the kingdom of heaven. If you held up a ticket to heaven to a Pharisee, he'd say, no, I don't have that ticket. I'm fine. I'll get there on my own righteousness. Jesus said to the Pharisees, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. All of you good church people, take note. Learn a lesson from the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Learn a lesson from Jesus, the King of Righteousness. Hear the wisdom of Solomon, known as the wisest man who ever lived, as he spoke for the Lord. He spoke to me and he spoke to you, lest we should think that we could justify ourselves before a holy God by our own righteous acts. For indeed, as he says, there is no one on earth who is righteous. No one who does what is right and never sins. Hear the words of the prophecy of Isaiah who foresaw the need for a Savior who would redeem us from our sin by His righteous sacrifice. He said, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Paul tells us in Romans there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. There's no difference between the tax collector and the Pharisee, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no difference between the one who's gone to church all their life and the addict who comes from the gutter. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no difference between Democrat or Republican. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no difference between black or white or red or yellow because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no difference between rich or poor. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Tax collectors and sinners were flocking to Jesus. They were seeking the kingdom of God. They sensed that Jesus was able to lead them there. The Pharisees would dissuade Jesus from allowing them to come, appealing to his reputation, his pride. But they didn't know that Jesus had emptied himself of pride in order to seek the lost. And they didn't realize that they themselves were among those whom Jesus was seeking. That was why Jesus was harder on them than on anyone else. They thought they were rich and righteous. But they were in fact poor and wretched and in need of a Savior. 
How many people here in America are like those Pharisees? I don't mean just those of us in the church. But our American culture, we have developed a culture that is unchurched and yet is very Pharisaical. They consider themselves to be psychologically sound, socially elite, politically correct, morally pure, ruggedly independent, intellectually superior, culturally full, but their ears are closed, their eyes are shut, their hearts are like stone. They cannot see that they are in fact empty, wretched, destitute, desperate, needy, corrupt. It's these very same self-satisfied souls to whom Jesus cries out, you say I'm rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. And white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. And salve to put on your eyes so you can see those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest. Repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. Jesus eats the tax collectors and sinners. Jesus leaves the 99 and goes out in search of the one. Oh, that the ears of our generation might be unstopped, that they might hear the Savior knock and open the door. Oh, that the Spirit of God might change the hearts of stone and replace them with hearts of flesh. Oh, that God would visit us in our wretchedness and revive our land and purify us from all unrighteousness. Oh, that God would change our hearts in the church, that they might be broken with the things that break the heart of God. Oh, that God might put a new mindset in us, that we might truly, truly see the things that God does and give Him the glory that He's worthy of and declare it among the nations of unbelief all around us. I know this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but it kind of illustrates our need to recognize the things that God does in our lives. Because I think oftentimes we don't recognize the things that God does. We pray for things. God answers our prayers, and we sort of just blow them off. We never share them. You know, we're told, declare his praises among the nations. And yet we don't even think of the ways that we could be declaring his praises. And, and the way that we do things, we often rob him of glory. I was once told the story of a grand piano that was given to a certain church. And when the, the man told me the story about the piano, he said this uh, woman had bought a brand new grand piano and uh, she planned on giving her old piano to the church. <coughs> And when she went and talked to the pastor about it, this is his words, the pastor must have guilted her into it because she gave the new piano. Now, the only reason she could have given the new piano would be guilt, right? Because after all, when we give things to the church, we give our old stuff, we give our cast-offs, we give our leftovers. Do you see the, the, the mindset that's here? The only motivation she could have was guilt. Is an old piano a worthy gift for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Is an imperfect or defective sacrifice acceptable before a holy God? The Old Testament law said, Do not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep that has any defect or flaw in it, for that would be detestable to him. We don't sacrifice sheep anymore, but when we do to the Lord, do we give the things that are defective? Do we give of our best? They were told in the Old Testament not to give defective sacrifices, and yet that's just what they ended up doing, just what we end up doing. We give our leftovers, our broken things. It's, it's the mindset that we have developed in the church that, the, that despite our words that say that the Lord is worthy, our practice says that the Lord is not Lord of our lives, but a peripheral convenient crutch that we will retain and employ only when it's convenient or necessary. A matter of our giving is a subject for another occasion, but let me address the story of the piano from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. I think the woman intended to give the old piano to the church, and when she talked to the pastor, 
I think that the pastor must have reminded her about whom, to whom she was giving this gift. Is the old piano a gift that would truly represent her love and her devotion to the Lord? And when she thought about it, I'm guessing, she remembered that old hymn that declares, give of your best to the master, give of the strength of your youth. And remembering that Jesus gave her his all for her, she presented the Lord with her best, the new piano. That people might well ask, why would anyone give their new piano to the Lord and keep the old one? Why would anyone find greater joy in giving up the better thing? What kind of a God is worthy of such love and devotion? What kind of a God indeed? May the story of the piano be one that brings glory to God who's worthy of our greatest love and devotion. We give to the Lord sacrificially because he first sacrificially gave to us. We give of ourselves because the Lord first gave of himself for us. We love because he first loved us. Out of love, he leads the 99 sheep in search of the one that wandered off. Out of compassion, Jesus left the glories of heaven, where he sat at the Father's right hand in, in majesty and power, where angels attended him, where he was glorified, and he made himself nothing in order to redeem you and me as his beloved bride. Philippians 2, we're told to have the same mindset as, uh, as Jesus, but take note of what the mindset of Jesus really is. Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider <laughs> equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, Jesus didn't just hang out with tax collectors and sinners in his day. Jesus pursues and woos tax collectors and sinners even today. He left the 99 sheep. He left the glories of heaven where everything is perfect to come into this world to pursue sinners that he might win them for heaven and for eternity. He left the many. He came for the one. He came to seek the one who wandered off. He came to seek the lost one. He came to seek the one who got lost by accident. And he came to seek the one who left on purpose. He came to bring us back. He came to bring us home. He came to restore us in his love. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst, Paul declares. And yet, he came for me. And for you. He came despite the cost, a cross of suffering and death that he had to bear for our redemption. Because of love, he did not turn away because of you. Because of you, he left the 99. He comes for the one. He comes for you. Have you found yourself distant and cut off, not knowing how you ended up where you are and wondering how you could ever get back? has come for you. He's come for you. Or maybe, maybe you ran off kicking and screaming because you wanted to have control of your own life and wanted to call your own shots and now you find yourself empty and alone. Came for you. Have others brought you to a foreign place far from family and Home and love, he's come for you. Wherever you are, whatever your circumstance, however great the distance, however deep you have sunk, no matter what walls you have put up, he has come. He is here. He is reaching for you. He left the 99 to come in search of you. He knows you. 
He sees you. He loves you. He waits for you. He asks you to tell him. That's what Lord, what awesome, what incredible love that you have poured out on us. We should be called the sons and daughters of God. Surely, we ran far away, and yet you pursued us. You pursued us to the greatest distance that you could, and gave the greatest sacrifice, laying down your own life on the cross for us. But Lord, each one here know the significance of your love for us. And Lord, teach us to declare that love among the nations, among the people with whom we make contact each and every day. And Lord, if there's anybody here who has never experienced your love, who has never met you, never called you Lord and Savior, this be the day when they turn and say, Lord, thank you for dying in my place. Thank you for redeeming me from sin. Thank you for inviting me into your family for eternity. I turn from my own ways and I would follow you. Lord, use us as your people. This day and in all the days ahead, be glorified in the church. In Jesus' name.